Today's video is brought to you by StoryboardThat.com. Please visit TeacherCast.net slash StoryboardThat for a limited time offer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 73rd episode of the Tech Educator Podcast. You are listening to the podcast that brings you the best weekly webinar in your house today. Hope everybody had a happy Halloween, and I'm glad that you guys are here. That meant you turned your clocks back. We are, of course, live here every single Sunday night at 7 o'clock, and you can, of course, find all of our great information out on teachercast.net, and you can check out all of our archives over at the Tech Educator Podcast. Dot com. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and we have a great episode tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking all about Apple Yosemite, a brand new operating system from Apple, and we're going to be sharing with you how you can use it in your classroom. We're going to be talking about things like iBooks. We're going to be talking about QuickTime, and we're going to be going over some ways that Apple Yosemite is being used in classrooms today. want to bring on one of our co-hosts from the great state of New Jersey, heading to the New Jersey Teachers Convention, where this week I'm going to be sharing sharing some amazing, amazing presentations. I want to bring on from the House of Ed Tech, Mr. Chris Nessie. Chris, how are you today? I'm doing well, Jeff. Happy Halloween. Happy Movember for those that are not going to shave over the next four weeks. I haven't shaved since August. I don't know what everyone else is having a big deal about. <laughs> I haven't shaved since yesterday. Yeah, really. So, uh, Chris, how are things over at the House of Ed Tech? Everything is good. A couple of uh, big news items for those that may have missed it. Um, one, my podcast is now hosted on Libsyn, which yeah. is a dedicated media site. So everything is available at a moment's notice. No more delays for the downloads. And for my website, no more mister.chrisnessy.com. You can just go to chrisnessy.com, and uh, there I am in all my glory. How about that? Brand new website, brand new podcasting host. Welcome to the world of podcasting, Mr. Nessie. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well. Also want to bring on from the great state of Chicago, Mr. Jeff Herb. How are you, Jeff? I'm doing great, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm doing well. We have a great show here, and I'm looking to hearing how you're using Apple in your classroom and in your school. Uh, tell us what's been going on in, that, in the uh, instructional tech talk. Uh, you know, we've had a pretty good week here. I don't know. Is my video showing up? It doesn't look like it is. Not yet, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll work on that as I'm talking. But uh, good past couple weeks here, we've been working on several episodes. I know that last uh, last episode I talked about a one-to-one -one, um, kind of overview that I've done with the school district. We're still putting the final touches on that, but we're really excited to be able to release that. We've also done interviews with Codable after they were on our show. Um, that was great to be able to talk with Gretchen a little bit further and be able to share that out. So uh, a few things in the hopper and looking forward to be able to share those in the next week or so. Nice. want to bring on also who just got done doing Ed Camp. Uh, is it, what, what Ed Camp was that, Josh? Chicago. Ed Camp Chicago, the great Ed Camp Chicago. Mr. Josh. Josh, how are you today? Doing great. It was a good time. Got to catch up with a lot of people and Learned some new things. Had a, Probably my favorite session was a tech coach roundtable mm -hmm. with there are probably 30, 40 educators who all do tech coaching in one room, kind of bouncing ideas off of one another of, of what works for them. And uh, just great for somebody who's new to that position to get all of that experience and all of all those ideas. Um, so definitely a very positive day for me. I always love taking the trip down to Chicago. Excellent. Uh, so a lot of fun. Excited to get back to school this week. Excellent. There seems to be a lot of professional development going on as we ramp up here. Of course, we gained an hour of professional development today. I hope you guys took advantage of it. No? Okay. Many of you guys might have been sleeping from your Halloween hangovers. Chris, you were trick-or-treating earlier. Um, you were wearing some kind of a mask. Is that that you have there? What, what was that? I, I was. I'm going to take the headphones off for a second. Uh -oh. I'm going to welcome in a special guest. 
to the podcast. Now, I have to warn you, folks. Waka Patui has uh, done a number on Mr. Nessie here. He has turned into a puppet himself. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Very From the House of Ed Tech Bat Cave, I guess tonight you can call me Smack Man. I was thinking like scru <laughs> Scruffy Man. Is that is that the idea here? What are you talking about, Jeff? I'm. I don't know. You. I. You need to shave. I don't know. <laughs> you need to shave. That's awesome. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I can't. With 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 that cowl on. It kind of looks like one of our former co-hosts, Jeff. Oh yeah, I can see that. I, I it, it could easily be confused with, with one of our former co-hosts. I don't know. Who who is that? I... Uh, the uh, iPad Sammy. Oh. Well, yeah. What's a, this is a treat for the internet. Is it? No. Uh, <laughs> so tonight we are going to be talking all about Apple and some of the great things that Yosemite can do. Of course, Yosemite was uh, teased to us a little bit in, uh, in in a keynote address over the summertime from Apple. And they recently released it. I think it's, what, two or three weeks old here, Mr. Herb. And it can do some pretty, pretty exciting things. Um, you've downloaded it. What do you think about Yosemite so far? I'm having a great time with it, and uh, the day it came out was the day I put it on. I, you know, a lot of people heed to some warning that, oh, you know, it's, let's check it through and make sure it works okay. Yeah, I'm not of that kind of mentality. I like to just throw it on the computer and see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've really enjoyed it. The design is wonderful. They've flattened a lot of the design. Um, the fonts are beautiful. They've changed, especially on a Retina display. Yeah. Uh, they just really look really good. Um, so in terms of a design factor, I really like the new visual features of Yosemite. Um, beyond that, I've definitely noticed, I mean, granted my laptop is pretty juiced up, but I have noticed some speed improvements and Safari. Safari is probably one of my favorite enhancements in Yosemite. It is, it seems like they must've just stripped it out. It's in great shape, looks good and is incredibly fast. You know, I, I completely agree with you. I love the features. However, I will say it's those stripped out features that are causing some uh, friends of mine a, a little distress. And maybe we could work through this one today. But I have a neighbor. He's like 85, 87 years old. And he yeah. really did. You know, he's been he's been on a Mac since you know, four or five years now. He loves Safari. He loves looking at his Netflix. And then I upgraded him to Yosemite. And he's like, where is everything? <laughs> so is there a way to kind of get this looking a little bit more uh user friendly for somebody who might not be quick to adapt to something that's totally brand new well that's a good i mean that's a really good question i think a lot of it is just getting used to a new a new style um i think inherently all the features and functionality are still there and then some um things that i think people will as they start to get to use them really enjoy and one of them i'm just thinking off off the top of my head is the ability to be able to stack tabs based on what the domain base is so let's say i'm on teachercast.net and there are six different articles i'm reading or i have a couple different pages open in the tab display view you can see teacher casts stack so you can have a stack of teacher cast tabs and then let's say you're also on instructional tech talk and you have a few tabs open there you can just see two different stacks of all the tabs you have open for that domain it's actually a really nice way to uh, visualize can you do a demo of that can you show us what that's like are you able sure. to hit that because yeah. I, I i don't I know that do feature it. actually uh, yeah, Chris, like, Josh, are you are you guys? I I don't know if you're Macs or PCs or where are you with everything. Um, I myself have only used the Mac in so much as if somebody I've been working with on something has one, then that's the only time I've ever really used it. So I'm coming in pretty fresh to the whole Mac thing. So I'm gonna try as we go through here to ask some really basic questions. Um, one off the top of my head is this. Um, this, you know, most people seems like they love their Macs a lot and they hold on to them for years, like five, six, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Mac rolls out a new operating system about every year mm -hmm. or so. Is yep. that, is that yep. accurate? Yep. So do you find that your device down, that the operating systems 
um, mainly are for design purposes and don't really impact the like the usability. You know what? My I, I'm sitting here looking at one, two. I've got three Macs in front of me. I I, I know. The the Mac that I'm looking at right now that's running our chat, that's running the YouTube stuff right now is a 2011 model. And that was the first Mac that I that I purchased, and that's what I was broadcasting on before I got the, the Mac Pro in here. I was really excited to switch over to Yosemite and use some of these great features that uh, we're going to be discussing on here, like continuity and handoff and all those different neat things that they showed off. And I'm, I'm, I was quick enough to upgrade this iMac, not my Mac Pro, not the, not the production machine that everything right now is running off of here. So I didn't want to destroy anything or have any issues with that. I purposely decided, you know, when this machine came out, Snow Leopard was on, which was, I think, four or maybe five operating systems earlier. I think it was four. I'm not seeing this thing slow down at all. Now, granted, it's not able to do some of the things that, that Yosemite is built for, such as the phone calls or or the handoffs and stuff. So I was like, okay, why don't these things work at first? And then I realized, oh, well, because in order for those things to work, you needed to have a 2012 machine and higher. And this was a year before that. So I'm not missing that. I can do those on this other, on my laptop, which I'm going to share with you in a little bit here. But as far as upgrading the operating system, they strip features out. They don't take speed away. And that's basically Excellent. what I'm finding out. Is that kind of what you call this, Jeff? I mean, it's not like you're – I don't miss the features that are not available to me with this. Well, and that's, and that's a really good way to put it. I mean, one of the best things that – here, I can turn off my screen sharing until we're ready. Um, one of the best things about Apple's design parameters, essentially, is that if it's not going to run well on the machine that you have, they're going to take it out and just have it not be a feature that's available to you. And I really appreciate that because mm -hmm. I don't want my machine to run like garbage mm -hmm. because everyone's been through that. I mean, unfortunately, and I'm not at all by any means bashing Windows, but some of their releases ignore the fact that people have really old hardware and they say it's compatible with it. And then it just runs horribly slow. Right. And there's no way, there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, you know, some people, I guess, might argue that they'd rather have the functionality and just have a slow running computer. But I think on the whole, people like your neighbor, Jeff, are going to be just that much more frustrated with a machine that doesn't run like it used to because it has features that they may never use, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. And, and you know, one of the things that Apple is always good for is that every time they do with these operating systems they always find a way for the operating system to use the system memory in a different way to use yep. it faster or to be able to crunch things faster and i know you know at least in the pc world you want to crunch numbers faster you get a bigger processor max you don't have to worry about that because uh, you know yosemite is able to take the onboard resources and just i i can't explain it but they use them in a different way <laughs> And right. and it's an it, it, I mean I'm seeing this machine run faster and in my in my room at school I've got 24 Macs that were actually a year older than this one they were running off of Leopard and we're putting Yosemite on them now and they're screaming fast and those yep. are five awesome. or six years old at this point and again I don't need all the features I don't need a full fledged operating system I just need something to work and. It's it's amazing. And we're going to get into all these things go on. Jeff, you have that demo ready for for Safari? Totally. Yeah, oh. it's uh it's really a cool feature and you're going to see on my screen as I'm sharing it out right now. Um I'm going to go to a different page here. Oh, look at that teacher cast. So you can see familiar Safari screen on my page right now. I have about four or five six tabs open. You can see them up at the top like you normally do. When, if you're anything like me, by the end of a good hour work session, I have about probably 15 or 20 tabs rocking, and you can't see them all, and it's kind of hard to find them again. Up in the upper right-hand corner, you're going to see two little windows stacked on top of each other. Clicking that brings you to a new-ish page in Safari that will organize your tabs for you. So you can see that you have a teachercast.net stack. You have an instructional tech talk .com stack and the tabs that are open within that stack are shown below it. So the really cool thing is that you can just click like I clicked on the second one in the stack and it took me to that page. I can go back and click on the other one 
and it'll take me up to the articles archive. Um, it's just a really nice way to organize. And so if I were to come to uh, the teachercast.net page, and let's say I wanted to open up, uh, let's see, let me find the podcast um, tag. I'm going to open that in a new tab. And it's going to open up here. And because I have uh, some, I have it maximized on my bandwidth, so I'm going to run a little slow. So now I can click here, and now you see three tabs under the teachercast.net. It just really is a nice organized and a lot faster for you to find the tabs that you're working with uh, really quickly. Where did you click again to make that happen? It's it's up in the upper right-hand corner of the Safari uh, browser. It's in just two little windows stacked on top of each other. Ah. If you click on it, it says show all tabs, and that drops you back out to this screen. That's interesting. You know, one of the things about the way that they redid things, it used to be to go full screen with an app, there was an arrow on the top right, and now they made it the green button all the way on the left. The green button. And Tell me about me, the green button, Jeff. It, if you, if you click, awesome if you click that green button right there up on the top left, yep. and I that brings you into full screen mode. It used to be an arrow on the top left, or on the top right of the screen, and it took me forever to find that button. I said, oh, <laughs> they've changed things. Can I show you another trick? Please do. Jeff, Very Jeff, similar to what we're talking about. So let's say, you know, some people are like, oh my gosh, I really liked having that other button that maximized the window in your screen. Well, it's not gone. It's just hidden. You can go in any of the gray areas that aren't being used by buttons and just do a simple double click and it will maximize the window. And for some reason, it's not doing it right now, naturally, because... If I want it to. Um, I did it right before we got on the call, though, so I guarantee it works. Um, I don't know why it's not behaving, but it works. So go try it on a window that maybe will not disappoint you like this one is. <laughs> it is nice to see a Twitter account with Craig Yen on top, I have to say. Isn't it the best? It's just a great time. Uh, did you guys have any questions here? Did we have any questions coming in from the audience? I have a quick question uh, about the... Uh... I guess the, the grouping of the tabs for you, there, sure. Mr. Herb? Yes, go for it. Can you save those groupings that when you open up, it can open like a default set of group tabs? So that would be no different than, yeah, you can set, I'm trying to remember where it is, but I can, I'll look it up while somebody else is talking and we can get back to it. But it's absolutely possible because in Safari, you're able to open a set group of tabs in general. And so if you were to open up Safari and then click on that show all, all tabs it'll show up just like uh it would at the screen i showed nice okay very cool and so and i figured out why it wasn't working in that one thing you had, i was in the show all tabs if you're in an actual website itself you can double click and then it gets larger did everyone see that yes yeah so neat it actually i'm not lying to you i promise there's one thing i didn't know <laughs> you know as we go through here one of my favorite apps to use is free and it comes with Yosemite, and it's called QuickTime. Now, QuickTime is, a, is an application that you can find on both the Apple and the, and the Windows platform. And I don't want you to confuse this with something called QuickTime Pro, which is a little bit different. Um, but the average QuickTime, and let me see if I can bring up my screen here. Uh, if I do this, and there's a baby. <laughs> and QuickTime can just be found as one of Apple's native apps. And most people think of QuickTime as just the media player. And, you know, if you're an Apple and you want to watch a video, let's just pull up this very, very adorable child here. I can turn the sound down. If I want to play a movie, um, this is QuickTime playing. QuickTime plays movies and MP3s and all of those things. I hope you don't hear my kids crying in the background. Okay. But... Um, so that's that's QuickTime in a nutshell. But did you know that QuickTime can be used for so much more? If you come up here and you go to File and you go to New Audio Recording, it pulls up this little player here. And as soon as I hit Record, I have my Mac right now recording the audio that I'm using. And it's very, very simple and easy to use. And then when I'm finished with it, I can hit this button here and... Can you hear that? 
Yep. So it's a it's a really nice audio recorder. You can easily use that while you're teaching in your classroom or better yet, if you are giving a lecture behind a Mac, you can record yourself as you're going. But wait, folks, that's not all. You can also come up here and do new movie recording. And I have to be careful of how I start this up because this is essentially going to be turning on my camera. And if I click on new recording, I've got all of this great recording here. You can see my screen behind me and everything works out well. And then as soon as I click on that, I now have this video of myself recording. That's pretty cool. You can do a lot of neat things with that as far as videotaping yourself, video, you know, using it as a screencaster. Um, there's a lot of neat things that you can do with that. And that is one of those free built-in features. You can also come over here and you can do a new screen recording. I'm not sure why this feature isn't up right now. Let me quit here real quick. Uh, oh, that's because it already was recording the screen. Let me start this back up again. Quick time. And I'm going to hit done. And I'm going to come up here to new screen recording. And again, all I have to do is hit this. And I'm going to click to record a full screen. Now, I don't know if you saw that little dialog box, but I can click to record a full screen or I can record just a certain square. So if I wanted to only record a window, I can certainly do that. And uh, up here, it gives me a little box. And you can see here as I sc scroll through, it's given me a little screencast. So people are like, how do I do screencast recordings on my Mac? What software do I need? And it's just that easy to use QuickTime. Now, what do you do to edit it? Well, you can put it into iMovie. You can put it into Final Cut. I hope somebody's okay over there because she's screaming her head <laughs> off. <laughs> and... You know, Jeff, this is really – sorry to interrupt you, but I think this is really awesome. And, you know, like with Windows, if you want to do a screen recording, you've got to go and either purchase software or you've got to go online and go out to sites and hope that your Java is up to date and all those different things. And then as far as editing that, once again, you either need this huge software package – um, like something awesome like Camtasia, or you know, it's just a a whole you know a big process of getting it to work. And and Mac kind of addresses that right off the bat. So I find that kind of neat for yeah. somebody who does a lot of screencasts. I mean, look, I love I love Camtasia. I'm I'm also a big feature uh, a big fan of ScreenFlow. That's what I do all my editing in. But you don't need to buy any of it. You know, wait, wait, I, I dare I say, wait till you go to EdCamp to get a free version of that stuff. To, to do a screencast of that, and then you take it into iMovie, and you can do anything that you want to in iMovie, that's free, right? Pretty cool. But I've got one more here that I want to show you. Uh, Robert, here we go. And if I go into new movie recording, and you notice that, we, you know, we've already done this feature here, but as long as I have and I'll pull it up here, as long as I have my iPhone or my iPad that's running iOS 8, as long as I have this with me here, oh, I guess I could have done it on this screen here, as long as I have this with me and it's hooked up through the lightning connector, it has to be tethered through the lightning connector, I can come over here, click on this down arrow, and I can click on where this says Jeff's iPhone. And I can even have this on my iPhone's microphone, although I don't know why I would want to. And I can actually, right now, I can pull up my iPhone screen. And if you notice, it even works in the lock screen, too. So, up, 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 up. And now I can sit here and I can do a complete screencast of anything that I want on here. And look at the chat room fly with this. So, for instance, one of my favorite apps is oh, – see? There we go. Someone just signed up for my, uh, for my newsletter. That's awesome. So if I want to do a demonstration to my kids of how to use KidBlog because we're doing it in school, not only can I sign this up and I can demonstrate this on my computer, I can also be recording this as well. And everything here is done for me. Isn't that cool? Wow. It's definitely one of my favorite features of the new uh, Yosemite QuickTime, for sure. You know, it's so tough when, like, I'm dealing with Android stuff to, to find something to record the screens on there. I'm sorry, and Josh. I found, yeah, I know. And I found one that can work for my phone, but not for my tablet, which has a much more user friendly screen, especially for recording stuff. So, you know, when you look at 
the abilities here with the Mac stuff, like, I, I kind of get the hype a little bit now. You know, I've never really <laughs> been into the Apple stuff, and I'm very much a price tag person. But, I mean, looking at all of this, like, just the ease of use and uh, from a teaching perspective, like, I, my mind is, like, leaking out of my ears right now. This is incredible. You know what? It's one of those weird things. Everyone says, oh, my gosh, the Macs are so in, so expensive. And I'm sitting here going, yeah, but look what you get. And that's just OS, right? Like, that's one. Hmm. That's just one feature of this one app that can do so many more amazing things. And uh, I don't know. Maybe we should do an entire podcast all around uh, QuickTime or so. But, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of different things in there. And if you're on the chat right now, we can put this in the show notes. But uh, Mr. Herb just put out a little tutorial of how to do all that stuff. Um, those are some of my favorite features. There certainly aren't the others. Any questions are we getting from the audience or any questions here that we have that we might want to hit on this stuff? Uh, Jeff, there's one. Oops, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, since you said that this is all built into the new operating system, do you see yourself possibly using this to create tutorials? Can this produce tutorials better than you've already done it or how you're doing it already for TeacherCast? Um, there's two different thoughts on that. Um, I don't see myself producing using that feature because I already have everything in a template based system using ScreenFlow, and everything is all like my workflow is I use ScreenFlow, I do it, I edit it into ScreenFlow, I make the screencast, and then I pop that into Final Cut. And where I have another template with the teacher cast intro and the extra and all that other good stuff. So I, I, I don't see myself replacing my current system. But if I'm on a if I'm on the fly, like, you know, that's that's my work setup when I'm sitting here on my Mac Pro. If I'm, let's say, at the teacher's convention and I wanted to make a quick screencast of something. Yeah, that's a perfect setup right there that anybody can sit and use. It also sounds great. I mean, if you're a teacher out there and you've got a Mac and you've thought about dabbling and flipping your classroom, you, you can do that now. You can just go at it. Yeah. It's, it, well, and, go ahead. No, please go ahead. I mean, there's, <laughs> I mean, okay. I, I, I guess, I mean, okay. I'm broadcasting here in my studio, but this weekend, you know, Chris, you and I are going to be at the convention where I have to take a stripped down version of this. So there's ways to do things on a professional level without using your professional tools. And that's a reason for doing that. I mean, if I don't have all my heavy microphones, that system, just using QuickTime, is, is if I need it on the fly, that's as good as anything. Um, another thing to consider, and it has nothing to do with the recording aspect of it, but if you noticed, as soon as Jeff plugged it in and opened up a new movie recording, it automatically shows the display of the iPad. You don't need to actually record to utilize this right. feature. A lot of people are using this as a way to have your iPad up on the screen and also be able to have the accessibility of all of your other apps and everything. So one of the issues that a lot of teachers face is that, oh my, I, and granted this is not a huge issue, but it's an issue nonetheless in terms of uh, speed of instruction. They don't want to have to unplug their VGA that's attached to their iPad and then plug it into the computer and wait for that to calibrate and then get, you know, it's just, it's very choppy. If you can have this up right away, going, you know, flipping just like between windows like you normally would, that saves a lot of time and it kind of has a much more continuous feel in terms of your lesson delivery. I, absolutely. Um, look, this isn't perfect. You have to have your lightning connection on here i mean when Correct. we do things here as a podcast most of us are using something called reflector which allows through airplay the the ipad screen to come up here and i would prefer that and i use that in class more because then i can walk around the room and be more part of the group rather than sage on a stage at a lecture hall but you can certainly see why one would work with the other and you know as you can see that that was that was pretty instant right there you know, as oh, soon as I hit, as yeah. soon as I hit, change the camera feature on it, boom, there I was. And I'm even impressed that you can do that when you're off. With with uh, with reflector, you can't reflect an off iPad because then your AirPlay isn't turned on. So you can Correct. do anything that you want there, and I I I really like it. Yep, completely agree. I think it's a really good feature that will probably only be built upon going forward, and. Who knows, maybe we'll get to the point where they do support AirPlay to be able to record. That would be awesome. Can I show you some iTunes features? 
Please do. I am a big fan of the continuity between iOS and and OS. And you know, they're they're not fooling you when they're saying that they're built building things together here. And mm-hmm. let me pull this up. This is the new iTunes 12. And there's a lot of neat things that they've done in here. One of the things that I love about this is called home sharing. Now, I'm looking at my MacBook Air right now. And it doesn't matter if this machine is next to me or upstairs or anything. It's, it's, the, it's, it's not where all of my stuff is stored. What you're looking at here is something called iTunes Match. And iTunes Match is basically it's a service for I think it's 25 bucks a year. Um, or it might be 29. I'm not exactly sure. But all of these um, audio files are in the cloud. So I have access to all of these audio files on my phone, my iPad, my any of my any of my iOS devices. Um, again, Thursday at the convention, Chris and I, you you and I can be streaming thirty two thousand audio files, and and they're not on my hard drives. They're all coming from the cloud. But that's not the coolest part about this. I also have all of our movies saved up. I have all of our TV shows up. But if I click on this button right here on the left that says this computer. I can also switch it over to where it says Mac Pro Library. And when I look at my Mac Pro Library, let me pull this up here, this is actually sharing with me everything that's on my Mac Pro, meaning my production machine. So anywhere from my house, I can have access to all the podcasts, all the files, all the iTunes University courses, anything, all the apps, Anything that I've downloaded onto my my a- any of my other machines, we can do this. And this is the same technology that allows Apple TVs to to connect with all of your stuff. Now I've been burning in a whole bunch. I mean, uh, uh, backuping, backuping a whole bunch of uh, media content for school. But anything on here that's on my Mac Pro library, I can certainly use this. And by the way, because I have it on the iPhone. I can sync that stuff up as well. This is invaluable. One of the things that I do when I go to work is I actually have my laptop in my office. And I project my iPad from my class, which is in another part of the building. And because they're on the same Wi-Fi network, I have access to everything on the hard drive of my Mac Air. And I don't have to worry about moving it, losing it, dropping it on the steps, having somebody bump into me. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. All of my files and stuff on my hard drive on my laptop are now available on my iPad. And as one, as I say a lot about Apple products, it just works. And now we're now. I, I'd love to Jeff get into a conversation with you soon in this episode about iWorks and Keynote and, and Pages and all that other good stuff. And I will get there. But just because of all the media that I use as a music teacher, I have access to all of the orchestra files and all of the recordings and all of the videos. And it's all done through Wi-Fi because of something called home sharing on iTunes. And it's awesome. It is awesome. I plug and... my I plug my my phone into my car. And because my phone is getting the data signal, I also have options to download all of these files into my phone. So while I'm driving in my car, it's all there. It's pretty cool. It's really awesome. It's really cool. Um, to kind of feed off of that a little bit, if you don't mind, is speaking to that continuity feel. Continuity is one of the features that's been built into uh, Yosemite in multiple different places. And I'm going to quickly share my screen here and show you just another one that's really been uh, a huge time saver for me. I am very commonly walking down the hallway, and I'm sure that a lot of my uh, staff members and students can attest to this as well, that it's not uncommon for me to be walking down, replying to emails, doing this, that, or the other thing. Um, But as soon as I get back to my office, I am immediately finished using my phone because I have a much better tool, and that is my computer. And um, if you're midway through an email, you know that it's a pain in the butt because you have to actually finish the email on the iPhone and then send it off. With Yosemite and the, uh, yeah, sorry, Craig, about the vertigo. Um, With Yosemite and the uh, new handoff feature, pay attention to the bottom left corner of my dock. Um, You're going to see that the finder is there. I'm going to open up a new email on my iPhone, and you're going to see 
a little icon show up. And that icon is the mail icon with a little phone in the upper right hand corner. This means that I can take the email that I'm in progress drafting and pull it to my Mac. As you'll see right here, it's going to load it. And everything I've typed so far is loaded into the mail app on my Mac and has been pulled away from my iPhone. And this is a huge time saver for me. This works for websites, works for text messages, it works for Apple, any of their native apps, at least for right now, it works with. It works with reminders. Anything that is in progress on either device can be pulled to any of your devices that are tied in. And that's really a great feature of Yosemite. Okay, so this is a new feature with Yosemite, so this wasn't in past versions? This was not in past versions. This is brand new to Yosemite. I think following this, uh, Josh and I are going to have to do a whole segment on why we jealous we don't have Macs now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there, see, there's a lot of good reasons for doing that stuff. And, you know, this whole, you know, like, this show is not a, a, a commercial for Apple. This show is all about how do you use this stuff in the classroom. And, you know, quite often you're trying to set your classroom up in as little time as possible. So let's say that I bring up this screen and, oh, down here on the bottom, it shows that I have my iPhone up and I'm using Safari. Maybe I'm looking for great recommendations for things to share with the kids. And I'm going to pull up exactly where my phone is on Safari. And so it pulls up Safari and it comes up to this website here. And you can see that I'm going to be using this website in my school and in my class tomorrow. And let's see here. Is the crying of the baby having an issue on my Wi-Fi? <laughs> Let's try that again. So we're clicking on here. We have this thing pull up. We have this come up. Oh, there's the website right there. And so you can see here that it's very, very easy to go between these different things. Um, I don't know. I kind of like this feature, especially if I'm if I'm I haven't tried it presenting yet. I'm looking forward to it this weekend. But there's a lot of neat features here to certainly use, Jeff. Oh, absolutely. No, it's awesome. I'm having a blast with it so far. What do you think about something called iCloud Drive? Have you figured out how to use that one in your classroom? Here's the thing. I think that there's going to be a lot of merit to using iCloud Drive. I have not taken a lot of time to figure it out yet because I'm so heavily vested in Dropbox. Mm -hmm. um, I have, you know, since Dropbox came out, I've been working really hard to keep that as my, ultimately my main storage. All of my computers, their home folders are Dropbox folders. Um, everything I save and do is saved to Dropbox so that I have complete continuity among all my devices. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, it's going to be a pretty big shift for me to get that to be the other way now. I mean, because all my devices are Mac devices, right. so I'm not really concerned about you know, cross-platform. Um, so I think ultimately I will move to iCloud Drive, but I, I don't have a lot of experience with it because, to be honest, I just haven't had a free second to figure it out. There's what a about you? I, I like it. Um, it's, you know, let's talk about what it's not. It's okay. not Google Drive, okay? It's not yep. Dropbox, but let's talk about what it is. It's like Google Drive and it's like Dropbox. Essentially, um, there was a thing called iCloud, which they gave you X number. I think the, the minimum was five gigs of storage space. And at the most, I was spending 100 bucks a year for 50 gigs of space. Right. And that was essentially an online cloud storage system to put your pages, docs, your keynotes, your you know basic, basic things that were up there. And then they also gave you space for up to a thousand photos on, on what's what's called a photo roll or something like that. Mm -hmm. What they've done is they've actually dropped their prices. So right now I'm paying four ninety nine a month, but I'm getting two hundred gigs. And instead of it just being a sandbox is the word where okay, only keynote stuff goes here and only pages stuff here, you can actually take this and I'm going to click over here into iCloud Drive. And all of my stuff is organized here. And Apple was even nice enough to color code it and put the nice little icons on here. From any of my machines, I can open up any of my text edits. 
I can open up any of my pages documents and I can open them right from here. This is just a simple finder window like you would see in any other Mac application. But I now have access. I don't have to open up Keynote and then open up something else. But what I've been able to do on here is we've been able to set up more folders. I think I can even put a folder. No, I can't put a folder into a folder. But now because I have 200 gigs of space, a lot of these Keynote files are really, really huge. So if I get info on this one, like this one here is a gig and a half almost for yeah. this Keynote file because I put all my movies in here. I put all my music in here. I present with Keynote rather than presenting with Google Drive because mm -hmm. I can't put movies in Google Drive without putting stuff up on YouTube. And in my world, that's that's a no-no. But anything that I need to is up here. It syncs with all of my machines it doesn't have there, there's no there's no finder equivalent yet on the ios app uh, on the ios platform but i'm hoping and assuming that that's going to come out soon it's just a matter of time but everything that i absolutely need is here and as more people go like you'll see this one here is this pixelmator here's all of my graphics that i have and so you'll see okay if i need a banner graphic or a bumper graphic i can just pop into here and I can pull up this bumper graphic. It automatically opens up the 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 the, um, the the platform that's needed, and it goes from here. So it's a really really neat tool. And I believe Craig said, does it do anything with email attachments? And yes, it does. Um, through Apple Mail, you can email somebody an up to five gigabyte file. It'll actually pull it off your desktop or wherever you have it saved put it into iCloud Drive, and then you would get an email that says, hey, uh, Jeff has sent you this file. Would you like to download it? And there's other features that, uh, that do that sort of thing, but not um, – but, you know, this is Apple's answer to that, or this is Apple's version of that. So, so to answer Craig's question out there, yes, you can do large email files. Can you do the same thing with email with Dropbox and Google Drive? Absolutely. Absolutely you can. Um, but Apple is now offering this as a service too, and you know, um, four ninety nine a month is for two hundred gigs. That's not bad. I kind of like that feature. No. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, off of that topic, if you're interested to hear another way that I think teachers could really use a new feature of Yosemite in the classroom, interested? Go for it. Um, it's using AirDrop. And I know that AirDrop has been a very popular feature among iOS devices. If you're unfamiliar with what AirDrop is, it's kind of a proprietary tool that iOS devices can use to quickly send, let's say, it's mostly been pictures uh, to other iOS devices. When you're in range of somebody else that has an iOS device and accepts incoming AirDrops, their little name and picture shows up on uh your device and you can send pictures, contacts, a bunch of kind of stuff to uh, their device automatically and it doesn't have to go through a text message. What's really nice in Yosemite is that you're able to do this between an iOS device and your Mac itself. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be a very in important and very utilized feature uh, in the classroom because a lot of one-to-one -one programs that are using iPads also employ the use of a teacher's MacBook Pro or MacBook or whatever it may be. Uh, this is a new way for students to be able to turn in assignments or turn in work or quickly get um, a picture or a PDF or whatever it may be to that teacher very efficiently. Um, I'm going to show you real quickly what it looks like because it's really one of the most simple things. Um, I'm going to utilize what we've talked about tonight, which is QuickTime recording, but I'm not going to actually record. I'm going to just have it open right here. So you can see my screen. I have a, uh, a couple of pictures, and uh, what I'm going to – you can see it, right, screen? Uh, yeah, we'd like you to blow up the second one, please. <laughs> we have four oh, yeah. babies on this program. Right. Yeah, I know. It's a big – a lot of my pictures are babies now. I apologize. Um, Much better than uh, puppets. So, Yeah, right? So if somebody's working on a document or even if it's really easier to send a picture, you can always use the screen capture feature on the iPad, the you know power button and the home button together make a screen capture, which saves it in your photo roll. Let's say I wanted to send this to my teacher. This is my iPad, just so that everyone knows the window right here is my iPad. Um, I am also 
on my MacBook Pro. The Jeff one right here is my MacBook Pro. I've selected this image. You're going to see in the upper right hand corner, keep an eye out for it. That's going to be the notification that my MacBook gets when I'm sending a file to it. So I've selected the uh, image I want to send. I'm going to click on my, uh, I'm trying, I'm having this out of body experience where I'm trying to actually get into, I'm trying to tap my screen and I'm not sure which screen I'm using anymore. Uh, <laughs> but you can see waiting and it says sending and then it says sent. And up in the upper right hand corner, there was a notification that said that I received a file and it shows up now in my downloads. So I can click there and on my Mac itself, the file that was on the iPad, it automatically saved itself to the downloads folder. This is highly configurable. You can save it, have it saved to whichever folder you want so the teacher can change that setting each period if they want by course or if they just have a general turn in folder, it's really easy to do. Um, but I think it's gonna be great for teachers that are collecting assignments from one-to-one -one students as they're either walking out the door or coming into class. So there's a lot of neat things here that we have going on here. Um, let's see, where can we go from here, Jeff? Any questions that we have from the audience or from our panelists tonight? Because I wanna hit a couple of big ones here before we get out of here. I think Still you can jealous. keep on going, Jeff. Keep I mean, on the going, Jeff. Jeff show is working great tonight. All right. Back to the pictures of the babies here. Um, one of the things that I love doing is creating iBooks for my kids. Now, this is not a new feature in Yosemite, but this is an Apple feature here. Um, came into my class this year and said, all right, I want to do a paperless classroom. And I got to tell you, it's November 3rd tomorrow. I have not used one single piece of paper, have not made a copy. The first project that we did was on, um, you know, tell me about your favorite artist or band. I made them up an iBook author program, and I can go into iBook author a little bit, but we made up these little iBooks and I put all their objectives in here. I said, okay, we're gonna be using this different types of technology. And inside of these iBook author programs, I made up a screencast and I can, I can make this thing bigger here, but I made up a little screencast so that way the kids knew what was going on and how to do different things. All of this stuff was all done in a program called iBook author iBooks author and uh, Jeff maybe you want to show off the spotlight too while we're while we're getting started here if you want to get that set up so there's some pretty neat things in the sure. spotlight but this is iBooks author and um, and I can just easily click on a new template here and it automatically sets me up with an ebook that I can publish either to my phone my iPad or to my or directly into iTunes so you can do a lot of things with this and my kids absolutely love this stuff because it was exactly step by step. What are we going to do? How are we going to do things? And everything that they needed was absolutely right here. I also love the fact that you do have the option of using iBooks here. You know, this happens to be the animal book. And you know what? Maybe that's not such a good one. Let's do. Um, oh, these are good. These happen to be. Why is it asking me to download stuff? But anyway. Um, these books here are great. A lot of these books you'll find are from Apple Distinguished Educators and or this one here happens to be from Disney. So you can find a lot of great stuff and use it. When I had my Mac Lab upgraded to Mavericks last year, I was absolutely in heaven because I knew that all my kids were able to use iBooks and I was able to create iBooks. And hey, Jeff, quick question real quick. Yeah. How long is it going to take, or I don't, maybe you said this, how long will it take to get your Mac Lab updated by your district to Yosemite? Uh, they told me it's going to be done during the teachers' convention. That's good to know. Um, what what is uh, Jeff? Tell me about this. What is the process to upgrade to Mavericks? I believe it was about an hour and a half, right? Depending on your internet connection. Yeah, yeah. Mavericks is about that. Yeah. Because essentially, it's going to download a five to eight gig file. It's going to unlock it. It's going to take about forty five minutes or less to to install, and then you have to go through all the. You know, do you want a security question? Do you want to this? Do you want to do that? There's a lot of different things in here. Um, so For some, I felt that Yosemite's install was a lot faster than Mavericks. And I maybe think, that's yeah. just me, but um, I think it was I think it was a lot faster. And Craig, no, there's no cost to upgrade to Yosemite. Yosemite is a free upgrade. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm waiting to see what Windows 11, 10, 10. Yeah, Windows 10 costs. Because Apple's actually, been now. Wait, hold on. I read an article this week that said that Windows 10 will be free. It better be. 
except for enterprise usage to upgrade. It so they are borrowing from the Apple model as far as I know. Stealing, yes. I mean it because Apple's been free for the last. Well, it was free this time, free last time, and before then it was twenty bucks. So they they better go free with with some of their upgrades. So, uh, Jeff, take it away on uh, Spotlight, because Spotlight, like, really, the whole idea between everything you do on your computer is, can I search for it? Can I find it? Can I get to it quickly? And Apple makes everything easy to get to with less than two clicks? I'd say that's about right. Let me get back to my Hangout here. I'm trying to find some good things to show in Spotlight, not that there aren't other awesome things to show. Um let me see. Spotlight is also very good at unearthing information. I don't want to share people's evaluations or anything on here either. Um, so let's do something innocuous like Ebola. Uh, if we type in Ebola in Spotlight here, yeah. you're going to see some information that was sent to... Oh, I have to get back out of the... Let's, let's, let's kill the Hangout for a second there. Wait, wait a minute. You got uh, so there... Craig twice on your notifications list? What's that? This is the instructional Craig chat right there. Yeah, right. Uh, so, <laughs> so if you were to type in something like Ebola, you're going to get a top hit, which is probably the most recent thing. I get you know, stuff from the CDC on my work email just because they subscribed us to it. I don't know. Um, and that's, there was an update about Ebola on there. Um, the next thing is a definition, Ebola fever. So you get definitions in line. Um, also would be mail messages that are going back in chronological order. Also bookmarks um, and history. I was looking up Ebola because I was quite honestly interested in it and trying to figure out what you know it was and how it worked. And so I had a Wikipedia thing in there. I'm not entirely sure how the Apple to sell 199 case to fix something is relative to Ebola, but maybe that's where it all began. I don't know. <laughs> um, but it, you can see how powerful Spotlight is now. It's not just a start typing things in the upper right-hand corner and it randomly indexes your computer. It's providing very relevant things. And I, to be honest, don't use it as often as I should for how powerful it is. I'm still, you know, one of those chronological or chronological, chronic go to your go to your browser and type stuff in. But it links up really nicely with Wikipedia. Um, for you know any kind of articles on there perhaps i'm not the best one to demo it because i don't use it enough jeff maybe you can give me some examples of things that uh spotlight has taken over in terms of what you use it for well let me show you that because i'm glad that you use the word random i'm going to pull up my son again and if you look right here down at the system preferences there is in system preferences here something that says spotlight and, and now jeff you had just said the word random and it's not random. Anything that you want is right here. For instance, when you type in something, and let's just type in the word keynote, and I hit this, the first thing that you're going to see when this pops up are my keynote documents, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you can't see this. Maybe you can. There it is. Um, but that's not random because right here I have checked off number one that I want to have all my applications show up first. Then the next thing is it's going to give me suggestions, then a calculator, then a definition, then presentations. If I want to, I can actually take number 12, which is mails and messages, and I can actually put this up as number one. So let's say that every time I go to do a, a search for Keynote, I want it to come up with my emails first. I can have that adjusted so that way my emails come up first and then my applications. And the same features exist in your iOS device. And in fact, I, I customize this so much so that oh. I actually end up on my iPhone and iPad. I end up deleting half of this stuff because I just don't care about it. Uh, whenever I'm on my iOS device, I really just want to find a, 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 an application. I don't care about finding the files because I find the files in the application. Um, here, I tend to leave everything on because I don't care. Um, but it's very, very easy. You can see here, like, what shortcut do you want? So if I type in command space, 
I'm just going to do that now. Command space. There's my spotlight search. And I can change that to anything that I want. So there's a it, – it is random of what it finds, but it's very, very detailed of what things are. And you even have some privacy. You know, if you say, like, hey, I'm in this location at work. Please do not search for X, Y, and Z. You can do that, and you can have it not embarrass yourself while you're giving the next ISTE keynote. And so there's a lot of different <laughs> things in here that you can use. So – is it random? Yes, but it's very, very detailed as far as how random it should be. So did that exist before? Because my, my random comment was really meant towards previous versions. I felt like it was just kind of haphazardly organized. It was, this is way nicer in terms of usability, in my opinion. Um, but I, did you have that kind of... Uh, minute control over things in previous versions yes because i am right now as we speak i'm on my production machine and mm -hmm. i'm looking at my spotlight search right now on mavericks and it's there too cool so it, cool. it's 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 literally the same exact screen it just it's been updated for for yosemite colors and stuff like that but it's it's again these features of apple operating systems Nobody writes about this stuff, but it's so right. powerful and so important in there. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here running a Windows 7 machine. I couldn't tell you how to do all those different features. Maybe they're in there. Um, maybe we should do a show on that, too. But, yeah. It's, Can it's, I show you something else real quick, too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're coming up at 8 o'clock, but absolutely, man. I know we are. I'm, and if you I have any is... questions out there in the chat room, please, please, please bring them up. Um, we want to entertain you and, and answer any questions that we have. So I want to show you this real fast because it's something that I get so frustrated about that I have to actually print something out to sign it, to scan it back in, and then email it back to the person. That is kind of eliminated with Yosemite um, because it allows you to do something pretty cool. So I'm going to use this extra pay blank sheet that we have here. If you open it in preview, okay, you're now going to see that I have this sheet here. It's blank and... Can you make it that a little smaller? A, make it a little what? Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, just to fit it into the window. That better? Yep. Okay. Uh, um, bring it down just a little bit. Uh, shrink it down a little bit. Shrink it down? Yes. Okay. Um, what's really cool is that there's a new feature that is a signature feature. And if you see my mouse right here, there looks like a little signature there. And if you hover over, it says sign. Uh, I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to click Create Signature. And what it allows you to do is utilize either your trackpad or your camera to capture your signature. So what I'm going to do is say, click here to begin. And your entire trackpad on your MacBook is now a signature pad. So I'm just going to do a quick signature here. And then I, it says, press any key when finished. I'm going to click Spacebar, and then I'm going to click Done. This one I was just messing around with, so I'm going to get rid of that. But let's say, okay, I have my signature in here now. I'm going to click it, and it inserts it, and I can move it right down here. I can resize it to the space I need it, and I don't have to waste a piece of paper and some extra time by signing something, scanning it back in, and then emailing it to someone. I can just save it just like it is right now and email it back to whomever needs it signed, and we're ready to go. But that Jeff, is awesome. But what happens if cool? you have your signature on a piece of paper already that you want to scan in? You know, I, I know that it's doable. I've never done it, though, but let's do it. Talk about something else, and I'll be ready to go in 30 seconds. The Eagles won today. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Crickets. What we're trying to figure out here, there is a way that if you have a camera, which all Macs do, you can actually take a piece of paper, such as this one here from Netflix, and you can have it signed, and you can actually, you know, put it up to your camera, and your camera will take the signature from you, and actually use that as a signature pad as well, which is really, really cool that it's doing that as an OCR kind of a thing. Nice. What app was this again that does this? Uh, uh, just It's part of the operating system. So but, you just open a, a PDF and it just works like that? Yep. Just another built-in feature, Josh. How does that make you feel? So, Jeff, did you demo it, or are you ready to look at it? I'm looking at it. We, we've been watching you. Okay, so yeah, you can click Create Signature. I just scribbled a signature on a piece of paper. I'm going to use the camera. I'm going to hold up this piece of paper that has my signature on it. And you can see that it's just taken my signature right there. 
digitized it. I, w- I wonder if it's going to – there we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And now what I'm also told, and Jeff, maybe you can help us and demo this too. It also does credit card and social security numbers. Can we try that one? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to put my blood type and a couple of other samples up there so that everyone on the internet can have all of my things. Your daughter's <laughs> middle name. Yeah, all that good stuff. Here we go. <laughs> so no, you can see there. Screen Recorder did pick up the uh, passcode on the iOS device there, Jeff. I did <laughs> notice that, but luckily that's a passcode that is a throwaway code so we're all good okay good good <laughs> I appreciate that though thank you so there are some some nifty features here that you know again don't get talked about enough don't get blogged about enough in the education circles a lot of this stuff i, I don't you know if you want to comment on this one herb i found out about this just by reading the apple blogs but i really haven't found a lot of educational blogs talking about this stuff maybe it's time for teacher cast to do something about that i don't know um but there's certainly a lot of neat things out there. And you know what? It is 8 o'clock, and we have completely exhausted our time today. But there's so much more stuff to do. Um, perhaps we can put this on another time. If you are there watching live, we, of course, have our calendar. And our calendar looks like it's updated up until the middle of December. And you can, of course, check that out and subscribe to that. We have some great episodes coming up. Um, we're going to do a little bit more on coding. Uh, Josh, I believe, is going to do one on uh, student feedback and student response systems. He's going to be leading that one. And then we're also going to be talking about using Google for student research, which is a really neat one. We're going to talk about Google Scholar, um, some of the research tabs, things like that that's going to be going on in Google. So um, next week is November the 9th. We've got digital curation for your digital organization, which is kind of cool. And then Sunday the 16th, we have app development from school districts with our good friends over at a great app developing company called Chris Sharon's. So check that out. Tonight, I want to bring you an amazing episode of the 30 Second Take podcast. It's a special spooky Halloween thing. And uh, before you get to that, I want to do a little bit of wrap ups here. Jeff, great episode tonight. Thank you for sharing all of your stuff about uh, about Yosemite. Where Absolutely. can we find more information about this stuff? Is it over at instructionaltechtalk.com? It certainly is. I'm slowly working through the different features that seem most relevant to uh, educators and the classroom uh, doing demos or just hand writing uh, different tutorials on some of the newer Yosemite features. Uh, We have uh, AirDrop is in there. We have the recording using the QuickTime feature. Uh, We're going to be working through some of the handoff things as well, Um, but definitely over at instructionaltechtalk.com, which is where you can find Twitter and Google Plus links. And yeah, appreciate the shout out. And find you on Twitter at InstTechTalk. InstTechTalk, you got it. Excellent. Uh, Josh, where can we find out uh, all about the aftermath of EdCamp Chicago? Uh, well, I tweet over at Mr. G Fact of the Day, uh, so I had a few tweets about that, um, and I don't know, I didn't blog about it yet, but I might, and that would be at mrgtechchats.blogspot.com. Nice. Chris, you and I are going to be having some fun this week over at the NJEA convention, aren't we? Uh, yes, we are, Jeff. This is going to be very exciting as... Uh... Last summer, I missed out on the ISTE Live, so I'm looking forward to NJEA Live this we're, Thursday. We are going to be having a good time. I am starting my sessions at 9 in the morning, and we've got uh, basically 9 to 4 o'clock. I'm going to be doing sessions, and uh, if I can get everything set up right, I'm looking at broadcasting all of my sessions out there. So you can uh, do some professional development from your office with TeacherCast and Mr. Nessie. Um, wh- where are we with the House of EdTech? What episode are we at? Who's our guests? What do we have going on this week? Next week, we have episode number 20, I think 23 coming out, mm-hmm. and I'm actually going to be featuring, uh, I spoke to Rich Kiker, the renowned Google trainer, so I had a nice chat with Rich, so I'm going to feature that conversation, and then at the end of the month, I have Jenna Klein from Class Dojo, mm-hmm. and all that great content can be found on my website, which is new address, Chris Nessie. Dot com and uh, and I'm always on Twitter, Mr. Nessie. And that's soon going to be changing to Bat Nessie, isn't it? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> you can, of course, check out everything going on here at the Tech Educator Podcast over at techeducatorpodcast.com. You can, of course, check out all of our great archives over here online. We are still um, 
tweaking things. I want to say thank you out there to those who are giving us a lot of great feedback. You can, of course, find us at feedback at teachercast.net for our email. But all of our great archives are over here at techeducatorpodcast.com. Do us a favor. Please check us out. And if you can, go to teachercast.net slash iTunes and leave us a review. Subscribe to our podcast. One of the best things that you can do for us is leave us a great review on our channel. We certainly love it when you do. And, of course, if you go over to teachercast.net slash YouTube, you can subscribe to that. I think we're up to almost 14 and a half, uh, th- not 14 and a half thousand, uh, 1,400 or so subscribers for that. So we really, really appreciate when you guys subscribe to our channels and stuff. Thank you very, very much for checking us out. My name is Jeff Bradbury. You can find me at TeacherCast. Until next week when we're going to be wrapping up the NJEA convention and talking about some digital curation tools, this is the 73rd episode of the Tech Educator Podcast.